this really is an honor for Bocampton, RJ Julian, Wesley, and to welcome two brilliant um, foreign policy experts tonight. We're, it's a pleasure and, and really an honor and a delight to have them with us. So Martin Indyk joins Richard Haas in conversation to talk about Martin's new book, which has been widely acclaimed. I'm gonna put it up here, The Master of the Game. Um, Henry Kissinger and the Art of Middle East Diplomacy, and it is more topical and timely than ever. Um, Martin is, as many of you know, a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations, and Richard, who is a great friend of Bookhampton's and RJ Julia, who we've welcomed in many different roles over the past couple of years, uh, is president of the Council. And they are um, friends, they're colleagues, they're partners in crime. They will have the most um, really engaging and provocative and, um, and, and really, as I say, timely conversation. And just as a quick teaser, Martin's had, he's had great press for this book. He gets kind of like the scoop press and then he gets the, you know, the review press and then he gets the post review press. and. And he, he's really been, um, you know, it's a kind of long tail on this book. And just quickly, the Wall Street Journal said, Martin Indyk's lucidly conceived and compellingly written master of the game, Henry Kissinger in the Art of Middle East Diplomacy, is much more than a tale of long ago diplomatic tussles in a faraway place. The issues surrounding Mr. Kissinger's approach to foreign policy remain current, and Mr. Indyk brings to the task of examining them his years of diplomatic experience in the Clinton and Obama administrations. His book deserves careful attention. And then Walter Isaacson, another friend of our bookstores, has blurbed, with his deep personal experience and his intimate understanding of the colorful players involved, Indic conveys the drama, dazzling maneuvers, and grand strategic vision that characterize Kissinger's virtuoso negotiations. So we have a topic, a subject who's legendary, and we have two uh, experts who are equally legendary. And so I can't wait for this to start. I welcome everyone, and especially thank you again, Martin and Richard, for being with us tonight. Well, thank you, Carolyn, and great to be with you. I was going to uh, do what you did, which was read some of those reviews, but Martin, I'm not going to repeat the excerpts. They're uh, one. Well, Carolyn as Henry Kissinger would say, you don't need to, but I'd like you to. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, uh, I, I have I have review, review envy, so I can't quite bring myself to do it, but they are uh, fantastic reviews and well-deserved. Uh, so Martin and I are going to have a conversation, full disclosure, we're, we're friends and we work together, so this will not be gotcha. What I will try to do, though, is get Martin to overcome his shyness, to draw him out on uh, what is behind this book. Uh, so let's start with what I, I think is in some ways the necessary first question. Henry Kissinger has not been in the witness protection program as best I can tell. He's been a rather visible figure in public life now for more than half a century. He's, he's written more books than I've read and he's been the subject of more books than I've read. So why, however many years ago, uh, did you get up one morning and say, what I really want to do, what the world needs, is a book about Henry Kissinger and what he did in the Middle East. Uh, explain the, uh, what led to this. Well, thank you. Thank you, Carolyn and Brookhampton and uh, Julia and uh, Richard, especially for uh, agreeing to do this conversation. And good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I decided that uh, the world needed another book on Henry Kissinger. Um, because none of the many books that have been written, including his own, uh, dealt specifically with the, the uh, diplomacy that he engaged in as Secretary of State for four years uh, in the Middle East. Um, people know him and books have been, many books have been written about Vietnam, Cambodia, Laos, detente with the Soviet Union, the opening to China, um, but uh, very few 
uh, people are aware of uh, his successful diplomacy in the Middle East, where uh, over the four years that he was Secretary of State, he managed to lay the groundwork for uh, the Arab-Israeli peace process as we've come to know it, and in the process, build an American-led order in the Middle East that uh, has effectively kept order in the Middle East uh, for, did for some 30 years before it started to break down under others' leadership. Uh, so I thought it was worthwhile uh, looking into uh, that and telling that story. Uh, also because um, I wanted to kind of unpack the idea of what happens in the negotiating rooms. What is diplomacy actually about? Uh, behind those closed doors, something I myself have experienced, you of course, Richard, have experienced it too, but very few people really understand it. And I wanted to use the master of the game, uh, Henry Kissinger, the, uh, the diplomat's diplomat, to demonstrate through the many conversations and negotiations that he had that are all available now in the archives uh, and also in the Israeli archives, um, to really uh, show people what uh, Arab-Israeli negotiations led by American diplomats is really about. Say something, Martin, before we get into the substance about the process. When this is, uh, how do you describe this? Is this a cooperative? It's not an authorized thing. It's is it cooperative? Is it non-cooperative? Is it at times cooperative, at times non-cooperative? How do you describe? So I say a little bit about the interviews with Henry Kissinger and the interaction between you in the course of this book. So I've known uh, Henry Kissinger since the time that I entered government and first uh, consulted him back in the early days of the Clinton administration. Uh, but uh, I decided to write the book about eight years ago, and he agreed to cooperate with that without any um, commitment on my, on my part in any way. And we had a series of interviews, uh, 12 in all, as well as a whole lot of informal conversations uh, over the years in which I was able to kind of compare the record with his own uh, recollections of it. He's now 98 and uh, he remembers uh, in amazing detail, sometimes day to day, uh, what happened some 45 to 50 years ago which is pretty extraordinary in itself. Uh, but uh, I said to him from the beginning, that this is not gonna be a hagiography. Uh, it won't have uh, any credibility if it is. And uh, he kind of went along with that. He wasn't very happy uh, with the result because he's a very sensitive man, especially at the uh, ripe old age of 98. Um, you know, I was worried about his legacy. But I, uh, I think that overall, uh, the book uh, paints him in a very favorable light, as the title suggests, even though along the way, I reveal a kind of warts and all of his diplomatic maneuvering and, and uh, sometimes uh, his rather important uh, mistakes that he made. Look, you knew, before you got into this, you knew a great deal uh, about the Middle East and about these, these times. Uh, but whenever you write a book, and I know this from my own experience, things you thought you knew, you didn't quite know. There's a level of detail, of depth, that you only encounter when you kind of roll up your sleeves and you get into archives or have a dozen conversations. And put pen to paper or whatever the digital equivalent is. What's your, what was your big surprise here? I mean, again, you're, you're so experienced, you're so knowledgeable about the Middle East. What, what weren't you quite prepared for or were surprised by or struck by? Well, there are several things in the book that I discovered in the archives. We can talk about that later. But the big thing that was surprising to me was that, I, as I said already, I, I embarked on an effort to write a deep history about peacemaking in the Middle East. And I thought that that's what Henry Kissinger was engaged in for four years. And what I discovered uh, was in fact, that uh, he had another purpose in mind 
completely, which was to build a new, more stable, American-dominated order in the Middle East, sidelining the Soviet Union in the midst of the Cold War, taking Egypt out of the conflict with Israel, using an agreement with Syria to legitimize that, and effectively ameliorating the conflict. But peace for Kissinger was almost a dirty word. It was um, something which he was highly suspicious of because of his own experience with appeasement, Second World War, uh, and his understanding from his study of history that the pursuit of peace with too much passion, too much energy, had the great danger of achieving exactly the opposite, which is to destabilize the order and, and to create war rather than peace. And so uh, that was my big discovery, that order was more important than peace and that a peace process, a Kissingerian peace process, was critical to legitimizing the order, but always uh, approaching it in a step-by-step, -step, incremental, gradual way and not trying to force an end of conflict peace agreement. For fear, as so, you told me, sorry. So go ahead. Uh, and, and the reason uh, for this, uh, he explained it to me in my last interview with him, when I asked him, was he sorry that he hadn't gone for the Israel-Egypt peace treaty, which Jimmy Carter negotiated two years after Kissinger left office, and Kissinger had laid all of the foundations for that. Uh, and so I asked him, did, did he regret not, not going for that? And he said to me, no, that... He always feared that if he pushed the process too hard and too far, he would break it. And for me, it was like a light bulb going off uh, because I realized, of course, that that's exactly what we did when I worked for Bill Clinton on his peace team in uh, 2000 at Camp David. We pushed the Israelis and Palestinians towards an end of conflict agreement. We failed and we blew up the process and the intifada resulted, thousands of people on both sides died and it's never been possible to put the process back together again by Humpty Dumpty. Say a little bit more about the difference between order and peace. People have a pretty good sense of what peace is. What is order though? What, what does order have and what does order lack that distinguishes it from peace? It's more boring than peace. It's more prosaic. <laughs> it's, a, it's, about, it's about stabilizing uh, relations between states, uh, particularly in a place like the Middle East where it's very volatile. Um, but if you think about the history of Europe and the wars that were fought there, uh, the establishment of order was a way of reducing conflict between major powers. And the way it was done in 19th century Europe, which was the model for Henry Kissinger's efforts in the Middle East, he had written about it in his, in his PhD thesis in his first book. The way it was done was first of all, to establish an equilibrium in the balance of power, meaning that the balance would be tipped in favor of those who sought to maintain order, stability and the status quo against revolutionary powers, revisionist powers, if you think today about Iran and the Middle East, um, uh, but Napoleonic France uh, in, a, in uh, 18th, 19th century Europe, early 19th century Europe, then uh, you have a sense of, of what the order uh, is about. Trying to contain those who would disrupt the status quo and take advantage of conflicts to dominate the region by uh, establishing a balance of power. And that's what Kissinger was always about. It's always seeking equilibrium in the balance of power. But uh, in the Middle East, that he did that with Nixon for three years uh, and it worked quite well by maintaining a balance of power in favor of Israel, the Shah's Iran, Saudi Arabia, uh, against the radical states of Egypt, Iraq, Syria. 
at a time when the Soviet Union was backing them up. But that balance of power worked only for three years and then erupted in the Yom Kippur War. And after that war, as I show in detail in the book, Kissinger decided to do what Castle Ray and Metternich had done in 19th century Europe. Take post-Napoleonic France and flip it, turn it from a revolutionary power into a status quo power. And Kissinger did exactly the same with Egypt and thereby created a stable balance of power. But it needed, and he came to understand this because of the outbreak of the war in 73, it needed a legitimizing process that would give Egypt and other Arab states a stake in maintaining order. And for that, there had to be a peace process. And that's why he was committed to a process of making peace. But the emphasis was on the process, not on the end game. So if I'm I were glad you to... asked me that question. I'm hoping it's not just the two of us now. <laughs> <laughs> right. the, uh... So if I were going to put it into my, my layman's terms, you seem to be suggesting that in diplomacy and statecraft at times, less can be more, that by going for everything, you can end up with nothing or even worse. Uh, and what Kissinger seemed to be saying, sometimes in life, more important than what you achieve can be what you avoid. And in places like the Middle East, it may not sound like it's really ambitious, but it is. But still, it begs the question, if that's what Kissinger is about, and you asked him the question, did he regret not doing more and getting what uh, Jimmy Carter got a few years later, do you agree with his assessment? Or did Henry Kissinger, how would I put it, leave some things on the table? If he had been more ambitious, uh, could he have achieved more? If you will, if, there's a, if it's dangerous to shoot too high, is it also wrong to shoot too low as a diplomat? Right, and I think that's exactly the, the challenge here. Um, definitely avoiding overreaching by trying to achieve peace when the parties aren't ready for it, or by trying to promote de democratic change in regions that have none, no such thing. Um, that kind of overreaching, which American presidents have a habit of doing because of our immense power and our sense of divine providence, that it's our responsibility to reshape the world and our own image. That kind of urge uh, has led us astray over and over again in Afghanistan is the most recent example of that. But on the other hand, uh, as, as you suggest, uh, by aiming too low, opportunities can be missed. And, and there are two examples of that that I to demonstrate in the book. And the first one is, is I think, interesting uh, because I show there that Kissinger had an opportunity to head off the 1973 Yom Kippur War and he did not seize it. Uh, precisely because he was wedded to the status quo, he did not take Anwar Sadat, the leader of Egypt, seriously when he offered to make peace, sent his national security advisor to seek Kissinger. This is now nine months before the war broke out with an, a far reaching uh, peace initiative and a sense of urgency and a willingness to, to basically give the keys of peace to Kissinger. And Kissinger at first was excited about the idea, um, but as soon as he ran into the bus or Golda Meir, and Yitzhak Rabin, who said, there's nothing here, because they too were wedded to the status quo. Um, he dropped it. And so, of course, it's conjecture, but I argue in the book that there was an opportunity there that he missed precisely because he was aiming to low. If you had written this book 20 years ago, before you went into government, do you think uh, it might have changed what you advocated? Absolutely. And, and um, that's why I said it was like a light bulb going off my head. When I came into government in 1993 uh, with Bill Clinton, 
it looked like all the stars were aligned in the Middle East for a breakthrough to a comprehensive end to the Arab-Israeli conflict. By that stage, because of Kissinger and Carter, there was an Israel-Egypt peace treaty. Uh, but the Soviet Union had collapsed just before Clinton came into office. Cold War was over. Saddam Hussein had been uh, defeated and thrown out of Kuwait, his army effectively destroyed. And thanks to your efforts, Richard, and, and those of Jim Baker and, and George H.W. Bush, all of the Arab states and the Palestinians were sitting together in direct negotiations with Israel. So everything was kind of lined up, the balance of power, the, the uh, negotiating framework, everything was there. And I said to Bill Clinton in our first briefing on, on the Middle East, if you put your mind to it, you can have four Arab-Israeli agreements in your first term and we'll be done with the Arab-Israeli conflict. And he looked at me and said, I want to do that. And off we went. And at first, it seemed like my uh, predictions were right. We had the Oslo agreements within nine months. We had the Israel-Jordan peace treaty within 18 months. And it's not commonly known, but we had a deal between Israel and Syria in our pockets when Rabin was assassinated. And had we been able to do that deal, then uh, essentially Lebanon would have made peace as well. The Arab world would have made peace. And for a moment there, we thought we were, we, we were there, we were done. And, and uh, that informed everything we did after that, this sense that we could end the conflict. Kissinger would have never gone for that. Let me go off script a minute, because you mentioned something. Uh, World War I would have happened without the assassination of the Archduke Ferdinand. There were it was a lot of kindling that was there. And if it hadn't been that, it would have been something else. Was Rabin's assassination, though, something that truly changed history, that was in some ways he the indispensable man at that moment to make peace in the Middle East? And when he was murdered, that you didn't have somebody else who could essentially either deliver Israel or reach out to the Arabs and Palestinians, that there was something actually unique about that one man? Yes, definitely. And I do think the role of, of individual leaders is critically important in, in uh, peacemaking. And everything you said is correct about Rabbi, particularly his ability to bring his people with him, uh, their trust in him as Mr. Security the relationship of confidence that he had managed to build with Arafat, um, who was a very difficult uh, character to deal with, the artful dodger, I used to call him. Um, but Rabin had found a way to handle him, and they'd built a, a relationship of trust. But in a very Kissingerian way, uh, Rabin was pursuing a step-by-step -step incremental approach, exactly as Kissinger had designed when he started, embarked on the American-led peace process. And this is a certain irony in this because Rabin had, had battled Kissinger when he was prime minister the first time and had wanted more peace uh, than Kissinger was ready to pursue at the time. Rabin was ready for a big step and Kissinger, said, but he wanted peace from Egypt in return. And Kissinger said, it's not worth having. You know, that's not reliable enough. You, you need to just go for some step that will be more, more tangible and reliable for you. So he, he basically uh, forced Rabin off the approach of trying to achieve uh, an end of conflict. And so when Rabin came to dealing with the Palestinians, he adopted Kissinger's approach, the Oslo approach was Kissingerian in its design. A withdrawal by Israel in three phases, no sacred timetable, as Rabin said, and no end game. You look at the Oslo Accords, there's no mention of Palestinian state, no mention of Jerusalem, no mention of refugees. All of that was to come later, as the, both sides learned to live with each other, learned to trust with each other, 
and then became willing to take the big risks involved in compromises for an end game. So when they took Rabin out, first of all, Netanyahu came in and was determined not to move at all, which from Kissinger's point of view was, a, was bad. You had to have a process. He basically wanted to kill the process. But then when Barack came in and joined with Clinton to redeem Rabin's legacy, it was as if Barack knew not Rabin, uh, knew not, certainly knew not Kissinger. Uh, he decided we had to go for an end of conflict deal in, Kissinger, in Clinton's last year and Barack's first year in office. And basically he demanded we go to Camp David to unmask Arafat or force him to make peace. Uh, and Rabin would have never done that. Let me ask a question which we haven't discussed, which is uh, in recent years, yourself, Dennis Ross, others, you've had Jewish Americans who have played a large role, but Henry Kissinger was the first. Uh, Jew, like you, an immigrant, but a Jewish American who played as Secretary of State, who played a significant role in the Middle East. To what extent was that a, an asset or a burden, both with dealing with Israelis and with dealing with the Arab side? Is there a reason you excluded yourself from this uh, list? Oh, happy to include <laughs> myself. I didn't want to suggest I was of such stature, but thank you. Oh, oh well. well, as I said, you were part of that Baker process that set it all up for us. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I, it's a subtext of, of the book to look at the relationship between the first Jewish Secretary of State, that is Henry Kissinger, and the Jewish state. And his relationship was fraught and complex. And many of the people uh, listening in tonight will remember some of those episodes. And uh, uh, I think that, that uh, he gets a, a bad rap because of that, as uh, have all of us in, in one way or another, um, because the expectations of us as American Jews is that somehow, you know, we'll only advance Israel's interests uh, when our responsibility and our intentions is to advance the American interests, which includes a close and strong relationship with Israel, but it doesn't include signing off on everything that any Israeli government wants. And so, you know, Kissinger at times had some knockdown, drag out fights with Israel, but those fights were intended to get Golda Meir in particular, to understand that if Israel was going to survive in a world of powers, as a small state surrounded by the hostile powers, uh, then it had to find a way to act in unison with the United States, according to a process where it could, would give up territory to gain time. And that was the argument that he made. In the end, it was highly beneficial to Israel. Uh, not only did Israel get peace, but it also strengthened itself, reduced its isolation, became what it is today. Uh, and many of the reasons why it's such a strong power today had to do with the things that Henry Kissinger did that were little acknowledged. Um, so I think that, that, you know, as a general principle, American Jews who come into the peace process, um, come into relationship with Israel, have a special sensibility for Israel, uh, uh, a genuine concern about its survival and well-being, uh, and and therefore have some level of trust uh, with Israelis, um, but the Israelis are always suspicious that somehow, you know, we're going to be uh, either accused of dual loyalty and will then bend over backwards uh, to go against Israel, uh, or will seek to you know to to prove our bona fides by um, uh, trading on, on Israel's concessions. Uh, and I think that's, that's fundamentally misunderstood. Uh, the Arabs, on the other hand, and Kissinger was very wary about this, he, but he discovered that the Arabs liked him, appreciated him, precisely because 
they needed him to deliver concessions from Israel. They thought as a Jew, he would be more able to do that than um, in his case, his competitor, and Bill Rogers, was who was a high wasp. I just got a few more questions and I want to open it up to people on the, uh, on the Zoom. You know, listening to you tonight, we've talked about Henry Kissinger, Anwar Sadat, Golda Meir, Yitzhak Rabin, and others. To what extent do you come away from all this with what, when I was a graduate student, we called the great man or great person mm -hmm. approach to history, as opposed to history really comes from below and there's inexorable forces. Or do you actually believe that what makes history as much as anything is top down? It's extraordinary people who do extraordinary things at pivotal times. What, what's your take on that? Well, I think it's a combination of, of those circumstances. There's no question that Henry Kissinger's diplomatic uh, virtuosity uh, was critically important in shaping the new order that facilitated peace between Israel and the Arabs. And his concept and his ability to do that uh, was critically important to the achievement. But uh, he couldn't have done it alone. And he's the first to admit that Anwar Sadat in particular uh, was, was a, a critical partner in this effort. He was a visionary, uh, a real man of peace, who had the ability to bring his people along. Uh, and in that sense, Golda Meir also was capable of making a decision and, and it's up a bit to and getting his people or her people behind him. So there's no question that in the story that I tell, these larger than life characters were essential to the achievement. But had they not... Uh, had, had Sadat not faced uh, difficult economic circumstances that were driving him to upset the status quo, I dare say he wouldn't have taken the risk of going to war. And had Golda Meir not come off that war in a situation where she came to understand that relying on brute force alone and a deterrence in the balance of power was not sufficient to ensure Israel's survival. Uh, that war changed her whole view of how, how to how go forward. So the circumstances of, of the time were critical partners, a partner to the leadership that these larger than life statesmen uh, showed. It is interesting to listen to you here and the idea of war as the midwife to peace because it gave the Arabs a degree of confidence and it shook the Israelis up. And those were the prerequisites, if you will, of a, a different mindset that paved the way to some negotiation. Uh, we think of war and peace as somehow in opposition. In this case, they were actually in an ironic or some yeah. other uh, complementary. Let me, let me just ask one last question, which is not the book, but the lessons of the book and apply them. Okay, so... Here we are, uh, this administration came in, you had the so-called Abraham Accords, a degree of normalization, building on the Egyptian and Jordanian pieces. So it extended to the UAE, Morocco, I guess Bahrain. You still don't have the Saudis. And then obviously there was no emphasis whatsoever on the uh, Palestinians. You have still the Palestinians divided between Gaza and the West Bank. You've got a coalition in Israel that even by Israeli standards is a, a cobbled together coalition. What are the lessons, if any, of uh, this era of peacemaking, well, of the Kissinger approach to a Middle East now? Like what would the logic, if you will, apply? What would it look like now to, to the task of diplomacy? Well, actually, it's, um, it is a Kissingerian moment um, because uh, the parties under the leadership of the United States have tried and failed repeatedly to end the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Uh, starting in 2000, but it's been four presidents that have tried, including Donald Trump, with his uh, deal of the century, all of which tried to address the end of the conflict, and all of, all of them 
came up short. And now we have a government in Israel that's a strange left-right coalition that can't agree on how to deal with the Palestinians. So we can't, there's no one there to work with them in effect. And the same on the Palestinian side for different reasons, a split between Hamas and Palestinian Authority, between Gaza and the West Bank. And, and the fact that Abu Mazen has lost almost all legitimacy means there isn't a leadership there you could work with for an end of conflict agreement. So in a way, fortunately, uh, Joe Biden, who was vice president when I was envoy for Barack Obama and John Kerry uh, in the last round of Israeli-Palestinian negotiations, when we tried again to end the conflict and failed, uh, he saw it, Joe Biden saw it, how impossible it was. He's not going to try it. He's got other things to do, other problems, as we see tonight. And, and so, therefore, the situation is ripe to steal a concept of your own for a step-by-step -step incremental approach because we all know what the solution is out there, the two-state solution, but we have no path to getting there. So we have to build the path. And that's what Kissinger was about, a step-by-step -step incremental process. And lo and behold, Prime Minister Naftali Bennett is talking about taking steps towards uh, the Palestinians. He has in mind economic steps. Kissinger always understood that there had to be a territorial dimension to the process. And so, therefore, there has to be some territorial steps. But there are steps that can be taken. Area C, 60% of the West Bank, which is completely controlled by Israel, can be handed back in pieces to the Palestinians, given over to the Palestinians, I should say, in a way that would give them a sense that there is a chance for a viable Palestinian state and give them a stake in trying to build, rebuild confidence on both sides in the intentions of the other. You know, listening to you, there's an important lesson here about how you, you need to scale your diplomacy to the nature of the situation. And what I hear you saying is uh, you get into real trouble as a diplomat if you ignore certain realities and get too ambitious. On the other hand, you may squander certain opportunities if you're not sufficiently ambitious. And what's critical then is a, a brutally frank, realistic, accurate assessment of what you've got to work with. And then you want to match your diplomacy to that. And maybe over time, you can, if you make some success with step one, you, that can then take you to step two, uh, which is, exactly. uh, yeah, and it's, in no ways is that Middle East specific. That seems to me a pretty good recipe for, uh, for just about, uh, Anywhere. One last question, because I, I was told to go to 815 and uncharacteristically, I'll follow guidance. Uh, what in your judgment is the importance of the passage of time? There's, uh, you, know, you used the word ripen before, the idea that time and exhaustion, that it sets things up, that when people don't feel it, they feel the time is sort of on their side. They therefore aren't prepared to make compromises, but when they see the trends move away from them, or they just simply get tired of the conflict, they get tired of the status quo, to what extent in a funny sort of way can frustration and failure create the, the, a moment of potential breakthrough? Well, definitely Kissinger believed that time was essential. Um, indeed, his whole concept of the peace process was one in which Israel would, would swap pieces of territory for time, not territory for peace, as we've come to know the concept, but territory for time. And time was important for Kissinger because he believed that eventually, if you kept the process going, the Arabs would come to terms with Israel, would become exhausted by the conflict, and would therefore agree to make peace. And time was important for Israel to reduce its isolation, to build its strength, the better to be able 
to make the difficult concessions, tangible concessions, that would be necessary when the Arabs were finally ready to make peace. And so that's where time became very important to him. And, and it's interesting because when, when the uh, leaders of the Emirates decided uh, to normalize relations with Israel the, and initiate the Abraham Accords, what was the word they used? They said they were exhausted by the conflict. And I think that that's a vindication of that, of that approach. But I think it's also important to bear in mind that time alone was never Kissinger's idea. It was a time that allowed for a process of maturation, a ripening process in your terms. Uh, and that had to be lubricated by, in the case of the Arab-Israeli conflict, by steps of territorial concessions by Israel in order to keep that process going. Otherwise, the Arabs would no longer have confidence that the, the process would produce a solution to their grievances and they would seek to go back to war. And so therefore, a, a, the, the peace process was essential to the effort to stabilize the order and eventually get to the peace. And it's worked in the case of, of the uh, Arab states who have all, in the end, now essentially come to terms with Israel. Um, you know, Saudi Arabia is, is kind of ready to, to accept Israel, even though it's not ready to move to full normalization yet. Just about every other Arab country um, including Syria, if it had, if it were capable of doing it, but certainly Syria in the days when Kissinger was involved was was ready, and in Clinton's days was also ready. Uh, and and so therefore uh, that that process has worked well with the Arab states. It hasn't worked well with the Palestinians, and that's because the process broke down. And we haven't been able to move it forward. Over uh, the last Israeli-Palestinian agreement, the Y Accords, was what? Trent was 1998. So it's so uh, it's 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. And and since then we've really not been able to move off the dime. And as a result of that, the Palestinians don't have faith anymore that that um, the two-state solution is a solution for them. And the Israelis have lost faith that the Palestinians will ever become exhausted enough to, to end the conflict. Um, so we have to find a way to get the process going again. And all of those people will say, well, we've had enough of process. Now we need more peace. Simply need a lesson in Kissingerian diplomacy. Hopefully they will read your book. Uh, Carolyn, let's... Uh go to some que better questions from other people on the call. Yes, we have questions that have rolled in here from our audience. What is the best thing you can say about Benjamin Netanyahu? I apologize if I'm not pronouncing the last name correctly. How baby, informed just call him baby. <laughs> how informed was he by his upbringing in America? And do you think Israeli's foreign policy has changed since he was voted out of office? So Netanyahu was, I think, deeply affected by his uh, American education and socialization uh, in his formative years. He uh, gave him a fairly unique ability to understand American politics and to play in it. And uh, he was very effective, particularly with Republicans. He modeled himself on, on Ronald Reagan. He was deputy chief of mission at the Israeli embassy in Washington in the Reagan years. And, and so he managed to develop a special appeal for Republicans um, who, who love him. And, um, they used to joke about him, but they, they wished he would run for president uh, on the Republican ticket. Um, so I think that that was the, the, the influence it had, was he understood how to play uh, in the American political game. Um, um, here was a case which sort of overreached where he thought that he could 
take on Obama and beat him. Um, and he failed. Um, so, so he knew it, but, but he knew American politics, but he was uh, somebody who also overreached. You recently starred in the great documentary, The Human Factor. It's such a great film, but didn't find its audience really. What do you think is the reason? Did the world lose interest in Israeli-Palestinian conflict? The reason is oh. actually that Pete Martin and, and you know, certain actors were not identical twins. And uh, that's what really held back the, uh, the uh, viewership. But it is, it's a brilliant film and uh, Martin, uh, Martin's role in it. Speak to it, but uh, I'm just Yeah, well, thank time. you. Uh, the Human Factor is a documentary that's now available on, uh, for streaming, I think, on Prime uh, Video. And, and it was made by an Israeli director named Draw Moret, uh, who made uh, the documentary The Gatekeepers, which is based on interviews with all of the... Uh, Mossad and uh, Shin Bet chiefs, the former chiefs of the Mossad and Shin Bet. And, and uh, that was fascinating, essentially, because it showed that these tough intelligence chiefs capable of ordering uh, murder, assassination, targeted assassinations, or any other kind of operation, blowing up uh, uh, nuclear facilities or whatever, that they all came to the conclusion that Israel had to make peace with the Palestinians. Um, so Draw decided to make this movie about, uh, about the American uh, peacemakers, the team, uh, Dennis Ross, Aaron Miller, Dan Kurtz, and myself, Amal Halal, who, and Rob Malley, who tried to make peace between Israel and the Palestinians. And, and um, it's uh, a... A documentary, why didn't it take off? Well, I think it's premature to judge that. It's just come out. A lot of people are, are watching it. Uh, it's had very good reviews. Um, but in the end, I think there's, there is something to the, the notion that people have grown tired of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict and tired of the kind of hopelessness after, as I said, you know, 23, 24 years since the last... Israeli-Palestinian agreement, and there's a sense of kind of stalemate uh, in which uh, people have lost hope, um, not just on both sides, but around the world and here in the United States, that peace is actually possible uh, between Israelis and Palestinians. And uh, as a result uh, of that lack of hope, I think people are not quite, quite uh, as interested in uh, a story that doesn't have a happy ending. Yes. Actually, Martin, can I, can I follow up on that? To the extent the world has grown weary of the Israeli-Palestinian issue, the Middle East, to what extent does that potentially become a spur to local peacemaking? Or to what extent does that mean it doesn't get the attention, it loses its urgency, and it's more likely to drift? What's your sense of uh, world weariness and its, and its impact? Yeah, I think that uh, it's, it's the latter. That is... And you see it, that the Arab states have grown weary in particular, and they've decided to settle with Israel and, and essentially leave the Palestinians to their own devices. And uh, you would think that that would wake up the Palestinians and say, gee, you know, we better get moving. We better re-engage with Israel. We better look at changing our positions and try to get what we can. Uh, try to win back the Arab support by showing that we're actually uh, engaged and, and willing to take risks. Um, but it's had the exact opposite effect. And I think that that is a product of the weakness of the Palestinian side and the divisions amongst the Palestinians and, and the sclerotic leadership, uh, a gerontocracy that's incapable of bringing young blood into the political process there. And, and so there's a kind of um, deterioration, stasis that, that uh, only compounds the weariness. And the young people on the Palestinian side have, have lost faith as well. So they don't 
press their leaders to move to make peace anymore. They've kind of abandoned the hope of, of uh, an independent Palestinian state. And now they demand you know, equal rights in Israel, um, which I don't think they're ever going to get. And so it's just another rabbit hole. But, but the energy is being channeled into a kind of counterproductive process rather than a productive process, which is why I say that we really the United States has a role to play. We shouldn't turn our backs on it because one of these days we'll be surprised, just like Kissinger was surprised by Sadat when he went to war. One of these days it will explode again. And so we need to find a way, even though we're engaged in so many other things, whether it's countering China's rise or dealing with climate change, we need to find a way to encourage a step-by-step -step incremental process that will start to rebuild confidence and give people on both sides hope that peace is, is possible. Another question we have here, do you think the process of peace over time by Israelis giving up land on more than one occasion makes the population and extremists more angry and gives them time to thwart the process? Yes, that's a very good question. And it is the, uh, the irony of the territory for time that Kissinger uh, introduced and sold to the Israelis. Uh, and he convinced them. It wasn't easy to convince them to give up territory, but, but he did. And he sold them on this idea of giving up territory for time. And if you look at that Israeli action since then, you can make the argument uh, that Menachem Begin gave up all of the Sinai for peace with Egypt, but also to make, make it a separate peace, which gave him time to consolidate Israel's control in the West Bank. Similarly, you know, Arik Sharon gave up Gaza, the better to hold on to the parts, strategic parts of the West Bank that he thought were critical. And territory for time led to a situation in which Israel used the time to tighten its grip on the territory of the West Bank through the settlement exercise. When Kissinger left office, there were 1,600 settlers. Today, there are something like 466,000 in 131 settlements. So that territory for time ended up creating a situation where it has now become almost impossible to imagine that the West Bank territory will ever be given up. I think it, there are ways to see that it can be done, but, but certainly um, the irony of Kissinger's process, and it certainly was not his intention, um, is that the, the Israelis have now um, tighten their grip so, so strongly in the West Bank that, that loosening it and giving it up will require another Kissinger. I hope it might require another war as well. Well, we're just about at that time, gentlemen. Is there any other questions you had, Richard, before we start to wrap up for the evening? <laughs> One last question, Martin. Uh, first of all, this has been great, so thank you. And thank you. And you and I have had a lot of conversations about the book. Uh, and each time we do it, I learn something, and I, I hear different things. So it's it, it, it's great, and it's no surprise that the book is doing as as well as it is. To what extent is this book also for people who really don't care much or know much about the Middle East? Uh, what is the to, what does this say about diplomacy as opposed to the Middle East? What are, what are the lessons of statecraft uh, that uh, might make sense for Asia or Europe or Latin America or Africa or anywhere else? So uh, I think that, that um, part of the reason why I named it Master of the Game is that Kissinger is a very good um, model that's worthy of study um, because he approached the world and America's role in it with a, a, a strategic concept. Um, and that's quite rare in uh, post-war American foreign policy. 
um, Kissinger, Brzezinski, um, many ways were the last of the strategic thinkers that shaped American foreign policy. After them came lawyers. James Baker was a very good tactician, a very effective tactician. But he I would have put Brent Scowcroft. I would have added yes. Brent Scowcroft to your list as yes. another non-lawyer. That's true. Exactly right. And of course, a disciple of Kissinger. Uh, before he became national security advisor in his own right, he was Kissinger's deputy. Uh, and and uh, so it's that strategic approach to the world, which, you know, as I point out in the book, has its downsides, definitely. But it it is a way of approaching the world and using America's immense power um, to shape diplomacy and shape the order in the world in a way that I think is, is very important. And there are a lot of lessons to learn. We've discussed some of them about the challenge of how to build an order, how to have a legitimizing process like a peace process, and how to avoid overreaching. Uh, that uh, applies in today. Joe Biden uh, comes into office with a kind of skepticism about peace like Kissinger, um, who has withdrawn from Afghanistan the way that Kissinger and Nixon withdrew from Vietnam, uh, who is facing a um, geostrategic challenges on, in terms of China's rise and, and Russia's uh, assertive policies. And, and it is in, in many ways a kind of Kissingerian moment in which uh, Biden is now committed to relentless diplomacy because he doesn't have the ability to commit US forces to the ground in regional conflicts in the way that previous presidents did in rather rashly. And so uh, if you want to see how uh, relentless diplomacy helped to promote American interests in a uh, unstable and and volatile part of the world when uh, American leaders didn't have the ability to put boots on the ground. Um, you should read this book because that's exactly what Kissinger did. It was a time very much like today. Oh, by the way, it was also a time uh, of, of internal upheaval in the United States, the impeachment of Richard Nixon. So I think that there's much that can be applied uh, from what Kissinger did with his diplomacy in the 1970s um, to the challenges that uh, the United States faces today. Thank you both so very much, Martin and Richard. It really has been our distinct honor and absolute pleasure to host you this evening. And Martin, thank you and congratulations again on this important and timely new book. Um, I couldn't agree more holidays are coming up. It's a book to keep for yourself. It's a book to also gift to the important people in your life. It's absolutely a book that needs to grace everyone's bookshelves. Master of the Game out now. It is available in store or online at Bookhampton, RJ Julia and Wesley and RJ Julia. And don't forget book plates, signed book plates are available while supplies last. So don't hesitate. And as always, we thank you all for supporting your local independent bookstores. We hope to see you at the next event. Have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. Thank you, Richard.